uh, an easy question. Uh, Faye wrote, how is this plan different from mainstream, mainstream asset protection plans? Uh, Faye, that's an easy one. And, and I'm, I'm going to start with an example of a conversation I had last night with a couple. The woman, she was with her fiance. Uh, my, the woman has been a client of mine for about five, six years, substantial lady, and she's engaged to a substantial man selling his business for you know, many, many, many millions of dollars in the next month or two. So it's a great thing. We have two couples. They've both been through total misery in some earlier relationships um, with some bad uh, results and death in the families and things like that. And, and they're starting out a life together where they want to uh, keep their funds protected from the evil world they know they live in. And um, even though this man is putting millions and millions and millions of dollars into his pocket, he asked me the question, should I do this plan that you're doing with Mayfair? Um, he, and I believe he's actually he's actually attending this right now. And I said, yes, this plan that Mayfair is presenting has all the bells and whistles of a mainstream major asset protection plan. What it doesn't have is me. It doesn't have as much hand-holding as this individual needs. And I told him, you can do the Mayfair plan. It's got all the bells and whistles. It's got all the horsepower. It's got all the issues covered that you ever could need covered, whether you're worth uh, 100000 or $100 million. It is simply not different. So to answer your question, Faye, how is it different from a mainstream plan? It's not. The only difference is it's a lot less expensive. But it, it, it's a fabulous, fabulous process for somebody who meets the right criteria. And that means that you're not sitting there looking down the barrel of a loaded 12 barrel, 12 barrel, 12 gauge shotgun. You don't have serious creditor problems, pending divorces, lawsuits pending, and your life is not already falling apart. In other words, the financial seas are relatively calm. For somebody who is not in trouble, has moderate wealth, this plan is just perfect and gives you the same quality as a $25,000, $30,000 plan without the cost, provided you're the right person. Um, that's, uh, that's a good way to get started, and I hope that that, uh, that, that answers your question, Faye. EJ writes, my lawyer says all I need is three or four million dollars in umbrella, in umbrella in insurance. Umbrella insurance. Well, EJ, your lawyer is right that you should have umbrella insurance. It's usually inexpensive. It provides meaningful protection. But don't confuse insurance with asset protection. They're not the same thing. Asset protection is not a substitute for insurance, and insurance is not a substitute for asset protection. A good plan makes your assets very hard to reach. It makes it so it costs a dollar to collect a dime. That's pretty much the ratio you try to go for. Um, so your asset protection is designed to make it difficult to collect money. Insurance is designed to reimburse you when you've already lost money. But the real point of insurance is that in almost every case, you can force the insurance company to provide a defense for you. So I tell people who protect themselves aggressively that, um, and do solid plans that they still need to keep insurance, both because sometimes insurance is a lifesaver, but mostly because it almost always can be used to provide an insurance policy, um, an insurance defense for you. The big problem is paying for the lawyers and the lawyer fees, even a little teeny tiny itsy bitsy pain in the Rear nuisance lawsuit can cost a quarter million dollars to defend, and it's awfully nice if you have your insurance company paying for it. So um, that's that's one question. Here's one. Um, Brad. Brad asks uh, ask about banking. He says, my only worry is a banking failure. Um, and he said, I'm worried about, about my bank, whatever bank I go to going under. 
Well, Brad, that's a really good worry, and that's why um, nobody sh should ever choose the institutions that you put your money into. You should always assume that the institutions are fragile. You should pick your own. We've seen that even the greatest, grandest banks in the world can experience difficulty. And I can tell you that um, there are banks in Europe that are much more safe than any banks in the United States. And uh, there are banks that are always better than Bank of America or Wells Fargo or Chase. Places like Pitt Day or ABA Omro Bank or Barclays or even Hong Kong Shanghai Bank. The problem is that those banks are really, 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 really difficult for an American citizen to get into. To join the club of offshore banking, you almost always will need an asset protection trust and or a related offshore LLC. That's because banks, in particularly uh, the, the European banks, seem to make an exception. When you bring an LLC to them, uh, they will often take the account when they otherwise wouldn't for a single U.S. person. They, are, they have decided that most U.S. people are simply not worth the trouble. The cost of having them is, is tremendous. Um, Pick Day Bank, which is my essentially favorite bank in the world, uh, just told one of my clients that the only, reason, only way he could have an account was to uh, pony up really substantial, uh, you know, way over $10 million uh, in, in, in long-run account commitments. That's the way, that was the obligation he had to make in order to get private banking services. It can be difficult. And why I think that this, this structure is wonderful is it gives you all the tools to go to any bank in the world, period. I favor Belize right now. I favor Belize because the banks are highly regulated and have huge reserve requirements, 24%. That's 24 cents out of every dollar in deposits is held in, as cash in the central bank. U.S. dollars, greenbacks, they hold cash. U.S. banks have reserve requirements of about 3%, and most of that cash is in the ATMs. Essentially, the U.S. government requires a zero reserve requirement, and that's one of the ways you actually look to um, look at the safety of a bank. But I, I do think that you should always have at least a couple bank accounts. I do think you should always worry about the banking, the banks failing. I do think you should pick safe banks. I do think you should separate your banks both from country and even region of the world. Um, I do think that the U.S. is getting to be less safe. And as we all know, the government now knows everything you ever do, including all your credit card purchases. There's not a lot of uh, secrecy in the United States even, but I can tell you my, my money is mostly out of the country. A lot of it is in Belize, and I'm much more comfortable that my money sitting in Belize is a lot less likely to be taken by a creditor than my money sitting in Wells Fargo Bank. Um, Abby, I'm going to turn something over to you. Let me see the question. Um, here's William. William asks, what does this cost? What's the process? Will you, will you take that one, Abby? Oh, Abby, Abby runs the trust company, guys. She is the person that you will be dealing with uh, going through the know your customer process and discussing with her the, the details of the plans. Um, she, is, she is the voice that you are going to get used to hearing in your ear. Abby? Sure, I'd be happy to uh, talk about this. Okay, well, um, the pricing that we're offering through this special promotion is a bit lower than our normal Mayfair Trust Company prices. So we have a couple options available, and that is um, a payment of $31.97, or we also offer the option of two payments of $1,625, which that ends up being a little bit more, but it's still both of those prices are um, definitely a reduction from our normal rates. Um, and Rob, did you... Ask me another part of that question. Um, 
other than pricing? Well, yeah, not just pricing. What What is the process? If okay. somebody says, Abby, I want to do this plan that Rob says has all the bells and whistles and is going to change my life, what is the process? Okay, well, usually we have a um, phone interview with the, um, the each individual and chat with them about their situation and what they're looking for in asset protection. And um, after that discussion, we begin to move forward, which is uh, once the uh, individual will choose names for trust and LLC, we submit those to the government for name approval. And that takes 24 to 48 hours. Once those are approved, then we go to work on the documents and the in-house attorneys at Mayfair Trust Company um, will approve and um, sign off on all the documents. And then that's the first draft that goes out to the client. And they have the opportunity to review and go over those documents. They can call us and, and we can go over them with them. They also have the opportunity to take them to their um, their personal financial planner or an attorney in the states and go over things with them as well. So they have an opportunity to sit down and read over their trust document and their LLC operating agreement. Um, once the documents are just how the client wants them, we move forward with filing and registering them with the Belize government. And that takes anywhere from two to four days usually. And once that's complete, then they have a, a Belizean trust established and a, a Belize LLC ready to use. And if they've opted for opening an offshore bank account in Belize, at that point, we continue forward and get that help them to get that set up. Okay, a Abby, I'm going to ask you about the bank accounts in a little while, but this is even more important. Um, guys, after the government has uh, registered your trust and registered your LLC, after that has happened, uh, then your entities are entitled to all the protections afforded international trusts in the, under Belizean law and international LLCs under Belizean law. That's really a big deal. That means in the case of a divorce, for instance, that the courts won't hear it. They don't hear divorce issues when it concerns an international trust. In the case of uh, lawsuits against the trust, they will normally be in camera, meaning they will not be reported. They'll be confidential you'll be able to take advantage of the zero statute of limitations, which makes it exceedingly difficult for a creditor ever to attack a registered international trust in Belize. And more important, those of you that have watched the videos on the thermonuclear provision protection provided by Section 27.7 of the Belize LLC Act, you'll all recognize that all of you that have looked at that will recognize that anybody who wants to go after your protected money is going to have to put up one dollar for every two dollars they want to go after and it doesn't say put up a bond or give them a promissory note they're going to have to go to the Supreme Court building and if they want a million dollars they're going to have to deposit 500,000 cold hard greenbacks with the clerk of the Supreme Court and it's a huge disincentive. You get those uh, capacities the second this structure is established. Now, Abby, I want you to go back to the process and I want you to tell them what they get with the uh, plan that is being promoted and presented right here. And by the way, what you get is exactly what you need if you're um, a billionaire, a millionaire. This, is, this can handle Warren Buffett, guys. So what do you get? You get a trust. What else do you get? Okay. You get the trust, the Belizean trust with the asset protection provisions. And you also get the Belize LLC, which affords you the great legislation um, protection that Rob just mentioned. Um, you get personal um, attention from uh, Mayfair Trust Company with helping you through every step of the way. And uh, we're here to... Um, answer your questions about 
any any part of the process, phone calls, emails, as you know, just so that we are um, sure to convey exactly um, every part of it that you understand it, and um, along with that, we also will um, at the end when your documents are registered, we send you a really nice package of your documents, and um, you will be very happy, guaranteed. Yeah, every everybody is. It's it astounds, it's astounding. Um, so so w w this is important. Um, Abby or Micah, whoever My Micah, you have the URL for the order page. Would you please show them where they go to to actually order this, in case anybody um, wants to know? I think it's important to show them where they can go to click the order now button. It's right underneath the video. Those of you, I think it's going to come up on the screen. Um, but if it doesn't, yeah, let me let me just chime in real quick. Um, just this is the page, and some of the information that Abby was going over is on here. And just to explain the full process, or just recap it a little bit, like she said, this is everything that you would get um, when you click here. You you'll click protect me, and it'll go off to the order form. Um, all we're doing today is we're not asking. You know, she mentioned the two payment options. What we're asking people to do, though, is just make a deposit because um, from doing this in the past, we've just found that it's not perfect for everyone. And so, you know, to make that decision without being able to talk to a few people is difficult. So it's really um, today you want to review all this and make sure, you know, you're not just making the deposit um, and losing that if you don't review the documents in time. But just understand that we're, we're wanting to qualify people. You do get to talk to Abby, but that's the idea is you can click up there, uh, protect me. There's another one right here. Click here to reserve your spot. Um, and it, you know that's kind of throughout the document. There's these little links that you can click, but this has a lot of that same information. Um, let me throw that out to the audience. Do you want that to go out to them right now, Rob? I think so. I just want them to know where they need to look when they're ready to order or they're ready to um, get the documents. We want everybody who does this to go into it with their eyes open, knowing what they're buying. You're buying a Ferrari and you're getting some driving lessons, but we don't want you to buy the Ferrari if you don't need it. We 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 really want you to show this to your advisors, to understand it, to talk to your lawyers and your estate planners. Um, Article two of the trust that you're going to be receiving is an estate planner's dream, but it's nice for the estate planners to look at it so that they know that it is a snap to coordinate your estate planning process with your asset protection planning. For example, Article 2 of the trust you're going to get is designed so that your estate plan controls the disposition of all protected assets. And if you want to change your estate plan, because good, you know, heaven knows the laws change every year, when you want to change your estate plan and take advantage of the tax planning opportunities available to you, you don't have to amend your asset protection trust, which is which is what most planners design their trusts so that you have to amend it. This is designed so you never have to amend it. You don't have to incur that expense. That's because I don't see any reason to spend five or ten grand to change a trust just because you're uh, disinheriting or a, a grandson or adding a granddaughter. You don't need to spend thousands of dollars. You should just be able to redo your domestic will and get it settled up that way. Um, and you see this green protect button? That's the button you push when you're ready to go. Um, hey, Rob, I've I've got a couple questions. Um, do you mind if I bring them up, or do you want to do oh, those no, later? Oh, sure. Just that's perfect. Um, perfect. So just on, on the note you were just talking about, um, Cash asks, can you explain how this works from a tax perspective for a U.S. citizen? First, the reporting requirements, and second, the basic workings of moving money in and out. Okay. The taxes are relatively simple cash. This, this whole structure is tax neutral. It's designed to not cost you a penny more, but not save you a penny. The trust, which is the main entity actually takes the assets in the trust off of your balance sheet so you are no longer treated as the owner of those assets for debt or credit or law and that's important because what you don't own can't be taken from you. 
but just as much as it takes those assets off of your balance sheet, it also ensures that all the taxable income generated at the trust level flows to the set law of the trust. That's you. That's the human being who formed the trust. And normally these trusts are treated as the same as estate planning trusts. They're called grantor trusts. And they're grantor trusts because the set law, that's you, retains the power to change the beneficiaries at any time. You can add Joe Blow, you can put in the Red Cross, you can put in your granddaughter, and you can remove them the next week. And, and, and because you retain that power, all the income at the trust level is taxed to you, the set law. If the trust owns a, an offshore LLC or even domestic LLCs or partnerships, all the income generated at the LLC level or the partnership level is passed through the partnership or LLC upstream to the trust and taxed to the set law. So bottom line cash is you're going to pay the exact same tax you pay now. What I didn't yet say yet is this preserves all of the tax planning opportunities that you would have as a human being. That means you can uh, definitely put a controlled foreign corporation under this. And in some cases, you can eliminate or defer taxes for a massive amount of time, sometimes even for your whole life. It is very possible to use insurance company planning underneath this trust. I have many clients that have actually formed insurance companies owned by their asset protection trust. And I've also have many clients that have private placement insurance working with their trust and it allows them to accumulate um, money, have income that is actually not taxable in the United States. It defers or eliminates in some cases taxes. So you can do anything you can do as a human. This doesn't foreclose any planning, but it won't save you even a penny of taxes. And by the way, if anybody ever promises you that asset protection in and of itself will save you taxes or that your bank accounts offshore are not uh, transparent to the Internal Revenue Service, if anybody ever tells you that, you run from them because they're about to encourage you to commit fraud. Do not do it. Do not mess with Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam knows what you are doing. There is no such thing as a secret bank account and there is no such thing as a tax-free offshore bank account. You can take advantage of all the stuff though, even treaties. You can actually set up a holding company and sell using the benefit, getting the benefits of all the treaties that can help a person who does international work. Mostly though, mostly the purpose of this structure is to just keep your assets away from creditors and the secondary benefit is to have a hedge against U.S. exchange controls. Some people believe that there's a possibility the United States government may limit your ability to move money offshore. They've done it three times in the history of the United States today. It could happen again. Fine. Uh, just look at just a way to hedge your bets. If you don't have confidence that the United States is um, the place you want all of your assets, this is your ticket to having a technology that will let you open an offshore bank account and really take advantage of the fact that no country in the world recognizes U.S. judgments. So if somebody ever comes after your offshore funds with a U.S. judgment, they're almost every case going to be laughed at and told to refile a lawsuit. It just makes it cost a dollar to collect a dime. Um, Micah, did that get the question pretty well? Yeah, I think that hit on that question. And there's another question um, that to just kind of add on top of that or take it a little further. Um, it says, you know, will having this type of asset protection plan become known to the IRS, which I think you just answered that, you know, that's they are supposed to file and all that. But more interesting part of the question, will this increase the likelihood of an audit or government scrutiny in you know, filing this plan, will that increase oh, the likelihood? That's a, that's a brilliant question. Is that from Cash too? I uh, know from Michael um, M. I just love, I love those questions. That's a really important question. Here's my experience. The IRS says there's absolutely no increase. 
that your, your chances of being audited are, are caused if you fail to do good compliance. You need to file a Form 3520 which says I have a foreign trust. That's an informational return. I don't, you know, it does not increase your taxes and you need to file your FBAR reports in, in the early part of each year for every bank account that you have abroad that has substantial over $10,000 in it. It's been my experience that people who comply are left alone. There are hundreds of thousands of Americans who have opened up offshore bank accounts in a sloppy fashion. They have not complied and they've committed crimes or very major uh, tax issues. They've created ma very major tax issues for themselves by failing to disclose their offshore accounts. They're all getting discovered. They're all found. If you think the government doesn't already know about it, you're, 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 I have a bridge to sell you in New York because they already do. About a month and a half ago, I was sitting with Mrs. Williams in Belize. Uh, she runs the financial um, uh, crimes division, um, uh, part of the, underneath the central bank. And she's a lawyer from Cardozo Law School. She's a tough cookie. And uh, we are talking about what happens. Bottom line is all your accounts are secret in Belize, but if the United States government comes to them and says that there's been a tax crime or a tax issue that they're concerned about, they're going to get um, pretty quickly information on whatever accounts they're requesting information on. The banks will be told about it and it's the process of the banks to tell you that there's been an inquiry made. But it doesn't, it doesn't happen very often, but it is always the process. And don't you ever think your money is secret or, um, or, un, uh, or, or, trans, or, or not, av not available to be discovered offshore. That doesn't mean that the IRS can get it. There is no recognition of um, tax judgments in Belize or indeed any other country of the world. The IRS cannot, cannot go to France and collect money, just like France cannot come to the United States and collect taxes um, through France. Same thing Belize. If Belize doesn't help Uncle Sam, then Uncle Sam doesn't help Belize when it comes to taxes. That's, that's just true with all, all countries. That help, Micah? Yeah, I think so. Um, if I could offer, would it be fair to say, just because there's some other questions kind of around this, but this isn't necessarily to hide your money, it's just to move its jurisdiction so that you're more protected. Is that? No, you're not trying to hide. Stealth matters. Stealth is a good thing, but you can't hide from the government. The, the last two weeks since last Thursday, uh, it, became, it, it has to have become clear to everybody on this phone that the government in the United States has already collected virtually every bit of data on you that's possible to collect. They've admitted that they collect, have collected all credit card transactions in the United States. Well, if you don't think that they know all money deposited and all money moved, remember all dollars get moved through the Fed fund system. Even between banks doing transactions between non-U.S. citizens, they still almost always have to use the Fed fund system to transfer money between banks. You want to move money from a Swiss bank to a Singapore bank, chances are the U.S. government knows every single penny that's been moved and can, tra can, can, can basically track it. Any more questions there, Micah? I, I can't see the ones that are being asked on the... Uh, by the audience. I, I have um, a whole bunch that were sitting yeah, there. Are, yeah, I have, I have a bunch of questions, but I'll try to keep it kind of on point. So if you want to keep going with yours, I'll throw in those that are on point and save the others till the end if that's okay. Okay, cool. Um, any, any more tax questions that you're, that, that you're looking at though on that list? Um, let me see. Uh, yeah, there's one here. It might be a little deep, but let me read this out. So, to move a company participation plan to a self-directed IRA or 401k or SEP IRA, does this trust or LLC process work to set up accounts in Belize? Can I do a transfer, no IRS paperwork, versus a rollover, lots of paperwork? And that's a question that 
I don't feel qualified to answer. It is very unusual for people to go to that trouble. The reason is that ERISA plans are just about as safe as anything can ever be in the United States. ERISA qualified plans, you can basically take it to the bank that it's safe. The IRAs are almost always safe and are easily converted to ERISA qualified plans. And that's like a $2,000 process. And a lot of people who have pension, pension uh, deferral in, in those types of plans don't want to lose their referral, lose their deferral, excuse me, and, um, they, and they don't want to go through the problems and the troubles required to, to make those changes. There's, there's easy ways to keep them, keep qualified pensions protected in the United States. Asset protection planning is a great alternative to it, but I don't think you need to lose too much of a sweat if most of your money is sitting in an ERISA qualified plan. Even OJ has gotten to keep all of his money after murdering uh, those two people. ERISA plans are not reachable by your creditors. Um, okay, I'm cool. gonna, Stephen asks a question that a lot of people have asked. Uh, this deals with repatriation orders. What if a judge orders you to return your protected money? Well, guys, that's an important question. And I've had this happen. Uh, I've, I've been in pitched litigation uh, many, many times over the last 20 years. And I can tell you, I've never had a client ever get a repatriation order. And I've never had a client ever be forced with being tossed in the who's gal for refusing to return funds. But let me tell you why, and then let me tell you the problem. I do not do asset protection for people who are over the top in trouble. If you are underwater financially, you have other things you can do. You can start fresh. You can use asset protection to give the, you the equivalent of a fresh start bankruptcy, but not this type of asset protection. This type of asset protection is for people who aren't really in trouble. You can be in trouble at the $100,000 level if you've got a half a million dollars, but for somebody who's looking at a $5 million judgment and has a million dollars in assets, this is not for you. That type of person will be funding their plan with a fraudulent conveyance. If you fund a plan with the fraudulent conveyance, then it is fair game for the judge to order you to return the money. And here's what's going to happen. If you do a trust with a fraudulent conveyance and a judge orders you to return the money, he is going to throw you in jail if and only if the judge believes that you are capable of returning the funds. If you are not capable of returning the funds, then the judge cannot put you in jail because that would be called criminal contempt, putting you in jail for uh, refusing to do something you don't have the power to do is it's 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 a violation of the due process clause and that's not going to happen the way to avoid these problems is not to be a pig pigs do get eaten in asset protection asset protection is for a portion of your net worth to have funds abroad that you can rely upon if the world falls apart around you it's to avoid the disastrous effect of losing everything it's not designed to frustrate your normal creditors. You have to always reserve sufficient funds to more than meet your reasonably anticipated debts. So that is why we, I'm saying, in Mayfair has said that this type of structure is only appropriate for somebody who is not walking a tightrope. If you're going to walk a tightrope, you need real, live, serious, professional, skilled advice every step of that walk. It is not for the slight for the for the faint of heart or the under advised. And it's not wise for people. It's always intelligent to do your planning when the financial seas are calm. Then the statute of limitations on fraudulent conveyancing runs. It's normally four years in almost every state. And it's zero abroad in Belize it's zero. So normally you want to do these plans where the financial seas are calm and then every year you do a little celebration. And after four years, you are 
happy as a clam. And after five years, you're happy as two clams. And after seven years, which is the longest statute of limitations if somebody claims you committed fraud, you're happy as three clams. And that's what you do. You do this, you put your money abroad, you save and save and save, and then when your life falls apart, you've got money to start fresh that nobody can take away. And that's a great, great feeling to go to sleep at night knowing that you're always going to have that cushion if the world falls apart around you. Hey, Rob. Um, yes. thank, thank you for that. I have a question that I believe plays into that. Um, and for anyone not technical, maybe a little explanation. The statute of limitations can be found here. But um, the question says, we live in Nevada and we homesteaded our home and paid off our mortgage, which years ago pretty much matched our $550,000 homestead. Now that things are better in Nevada, our home is probably worth 150000 more than the 550000 homestead. We don't have judgments against us now, and here's where the question gets interesting. So we don't have judgments against us now, but we are in lawsuits now where that can happen. Any suggestions on how to handle this? So in a lawsuit where there's not a judgment or whatever, how do you, where is the fraudulent conveyance defined, and maybe can you explain that? Yes, and it's, it's more of a, a question of art than science. Um, one of the big questions you'd ask is, what do these people do for a living? Uh, they've got, in this case, we're going to assume that they have $550,000 of protection available by the homestead. And if their house is worth $150,000 more than that, then if a creditor took their house, the creditor would get the $150,000 that was left after the client took the homestead. And the questions are, how can you protect that 150? Well, one way to do it is to put a line of credit against the house. If the client, if the client, let's just say it was two couples, uh, one was a principal of a high school and the other one was a fire chief, and they were both making substantial money together, way over a hundred thousand a year, mid mid one hundreds a year easily between the two of them, and those two people, you can say, you know what? Let's put a $200,000, $300,000, $400,000 line of credit against the house, and you can borrow that money, put that into a protected environment such as a bank account owned by the offshore LLC in Belize or in Switzerland or in England or anywhere you want to open a bank account. That's really important. You can go anywhere. Um, that, that money would be protected but it's pretty hard to argue that that's a fraudulent conveyance because we have two uh, employed people making $150,000 a year between us and over a couple year period they could certainly pay off um, pay off debts. I mean they're, 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 it's perfectly appropriate to borrow money and protect it. It makes sense to put money abroad if you have any risk that that if you feel any risk that the United States society is not as stable as you want it to be. A significant portion of the people in the United States feel that their money is not as safe in the United States as it might be in other countries, including Belize. And so the problem you want to do is you want to make sure you, um, you walk that line with the capacity to at least arguably pay your debts. Many times these types of lawsuits are just nu nuisances. I have a doctor who does laser surgery in Florida. He makes way over a million dollars a year, and he got sued by a girlfriend. He's a real good-looking guy. He's about 45, single, and he got sued by a, a girl that he was dating for giving her herpes on her lips. She sued him for half a million dollars. I think he settled with her for um, 50 or 150,000. I can't. Re I think it was 50,000 in this case. It just just to avoid the cost of litigation because these types of things were not covered by insurance. His, his errors and omission malpractice insurance didn't cover giving a girl herpes on the mouth. But <laughs> so you got those types of situations where, where um, you, have, uh, you have unusual cases where, where you get wake up calls. And in that case, I thought that that case was a ridiculous case. It was a wake-up call. Your friend, uh, the, the, the guy asking this question, one of the things that you, that you need to do is analyze the litigation. If your litigator comes and says, I've got some really good defenses. They're asking for $20 million. But, Rob, their chances of winning 
are small, then I have very little problem once he writes me that in an email and I have my little butt protected. I have little problem advising that person on how to put together an asset protection plan that will keep that person's money safe from those creditors even if he loses the lawsuit. Now that's aggressive. That's not a Mayfair plan at this level. That requires hand-holding and communication, serious communication between your litigator and your asset protection experts and your accountants. Does that get it, that get it Micah? Um, I think so and uh, follow up if you would if that doesn't help out there. Uh, a question kind of related to that just because we were talking about real estate and it sounded like you offered an, ex uh, an explanation for this but another question was what um, <clears throat> I'm sorry is um, is it appropriate to put your paid for personal residence into the trust? That's a really good question and normally guys I don't look at your trust as an appropriate place to put domestic a, a, a person a person's private use domestic home the trust is for protecting uh, your nest egg and cash and cash equivalents you can pay me a million dollars to do the best plan ever done in the whole world and if you put a piece of real estate in it and even if we even if we encumber the real estate I have seen judges and they do have the power with the single stroke of a pin on an order to remove whatever encumbrances you've put and to make that real estate available to creditors. Real estate is difficult to protect and I personally um, have many clients with lots of domestic family limited partnerships or domestic um, LLCs and if you look at the screen right now you'll see the asset protection trust which is that blue bucket going down to the green triangle. That's where you can put domestic real estate and yes it makes sense to put apartment houses and business assets in there. It makes very little sense to put homes in it. There's also risk, although it's never happened to date, there's a risk that the IRS could claim that the interest deduction was not available because you put your home into an LLC or a uh, or, a, or a partnership and therefore turned it into a business type of asset. You just don't, I, I don't like protecting single residences that are your family's home, the homestead. I don't like putting that into trust. With that said, many of my clients insist upon doing it. I can point to not any real major problems with doing it other than it doesn't make as much sense. If you had a $2 million estate, I'd rather you put uh, three or, or two hundred thousand dollar estate. I'd rather you. I'd, and half of it was real estate, and half of it was liquidity. I'd rather you protect your liquidity and leave your your real estate um, in an unprotected environment and homestead using the local laws. If you had problems come up though, and litigation started happening or was on the horizon, I'd seriously think about violating my normal principles of not putting the house into the trust. Uh, so, so the answer is there's no hard and fast rule, Micah. I, I prefer not to do it, but I do it a lot. Good enough. Okay, cool. Thank you for that. And guys, if um, I think so, if if there's a follow up that anyone has from these being answered, you know, please toss that in as well. And if you would relate it to the other uh, question from earlier, just because there's a lot coming in. Um, there's a couple questions here, and this one just popped up. I think uh, from earlier, a lot of people would be interested. Um, the question actually just says, um, you know, isn't there a 35% transfer tax out to a foreign trust? Is that the case? No, there is not. Uh, there is a, there is not a 35% transfer tax to a domestic or foreign grant or trust. If you took assets and transferred them to a, um, just move them abroad. For instance, under 367, there's a big tax when you simply move business assets from a U.S. company to an offshore company. But because this is a grantor trust, um, it's not really treated as being moved off your balance sheet for tax purposes. It is moved off your balance sheet for debtor creditor purposes, and your creditors are not entitled to it. But as far as Uncle Sam is concerned, you're still paying taxes on it. If you moved it to the type of trust that I do not do and do not recommend, that would be a 
a non-grantor trust, there would be a tax on that. Don't do that. Don't ever get caught in that, guys. That's a big mistake. Um, here's one from Peter. How do I change trust companies? And then follow up. Can I terminate the trust? Guys, many, 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 many times um, during litigation, you will want to change the situs of your trust. Normally, you want to change your situs of your trust to Belize or to the Cook Islands because those are the two places that have just totally tremendous, state-of-the-art, just hard, anti-creditor, mean-spirited laws. It's a mess to go try to collect money uh, when they've used a Belize or a Cook Islands trust company. And yes, we, we, we can make it really, really tough, but to change a trust, if you went to, if say you started in St. Lucia, which is one of my favorite places, or you started in Bermuda or England, and you wanted to get good asset protection legislation, say you wanted to move it to Belize, it would take you about an hour to do that. You would simply hire a Belizean trust company and you would fire your trust company in St. Lucia. And by simply doing that, you have changed the situs of your trust. It took you two hours. It costs you two hours of somebody's professional services. And your creditors or the people attempting to see how they might challenge you are stuck with a six-month process. They know you, they don't even really know you have fired your old trust company. They'll usually have to litigate in that environment to find out that that trust company no longer has anything. They might spend six months litigating there only to find out you've moved to another uh, country. They wouldn't even normally know which trust company in that other company country. And they would be back to another six months to a year of just trying to discover where the trust was controlled. It's a huge way to make your your opponents spend a hundred dollars in this case for every dollar you spend. So that's how you change trust companies. It's a very potent tool to discourage a creditor. And anonymous asked, that was a but a follow up to Peter. How can I terminate the trust? The trust is irrevocable, but in the definition of trust period, and all of you will be showing this, all of you that do it. It says that your trust can be terminated by the trustee with the written consent of the protector anytime after three years. And upon termination, all of the proceeds in the trust are distributed to the set lawyer. That's you. That means if you ever get really sick and tired of this, you can terminate it I've, uh, and, and receive all the money back. That has to be done by the trustee with the written consent of the protector you will normally be the protector. I have my clients normally be the protector when the, when the financial seas are calm. If the financial seas are not calm, you will want a professional protector. But when the financial seas are calm, you, along with your trust company, can terminate the trust. And you know if the trust company didn't go along with it, you'd fire the trust company and get one that would because the settlor has the power to always um, change trustees at any time for no reason. In the 20 plus years I've done this, I've only had two people terminate their trust and both of them regretted it. One lady terminated her trust. She was uh, in her 60s. She's had quite a bit of money from a prior marriage. She had fallen in love with a 76-year-old um, psychiatrist and she married the psychiatrist but he convinced her, I think, um, improperly that she couldn't possibly love him if she kept her assets protected and that if she really loved him she wouldn't keep him protected and after a meeting with her daughters and everybody in her family was basically like one of those in, it, it, where, where we were trying to talk her out of it it was really very emotional she stood up she terminated her trust she married the guy and three years later he divorced her and took a good part of her money I hope that none of you who do this ever terminate your trust, but you can terminate it. Jeff said, what does a protector do? Well, um, that's an, that's, since I just raised protectors, it's a good follow-up. A protector is a naysayer. A protector has no power to do anything, but the protector has the power to stop the trustee from doing anything that you wouldn't like. 
ideally the protector would be a person other than yourself but normally when the financial seas are calm my clients are the protectors it's an important position it has no power to do anything but all the power to keep the trustee from doing anything uh, and, and from doing anything that the, the settler wouldn't want and guys remember it is your goal to never trust the trust company Abby and her cohorts this trust company is owned by two major legal families in Belize uh, big shots and they've put a lot of money in to, in the deposits with the government they have decades of relationships and that's that's why they're able to get licenses but these trust companies you need to assume they're crooked they're not Abby's not crooked Mayfair's not crooked but just assume that they're 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 not you and never ever put yourself in a position where you trust that little purple and blue bucket you don't want to trust that yellow trust company that runs the purple and blue bucket instead you want all of your assets to be in that little orange triangle underneath the asset protection trust called the offshore LLC which is managed by you the set law if you look at the picture on your screen you'll see that the manager of the offshore LLC is you this is really key every single thing I've ever done for the 20 plus years I've been doing it is designed to keep you in control and to keep the trust company and anybody else from being able to take your money or hurt you in any way period um, hey Ron okay. yes sir um, I've, I've got a question or two to throw here from the live screen but I just want to kind of bring up something you said to me long ago if I could because you keep alluding to it but you said that a lot of this is game theory and just meaning you know like you're saying don't trust the trust company even though they're a good company it's explain kind of game theory in your mind and how it applies because I thought that was really helpful well it's a process there isn't any hard and fast rules Micah I mean you must have heard me say it a hundred times when I did your plan for you don't trust anybody and the first two rules of asset protection first rule what you don't own can't be taken from you so that's why we use the asset protection trust we that takes your your assets off of your balance sheet and the second rule no country in the world enforces US judgments no country in the world that means you, you you put your money off of your balance sheet and move it to a different country you've triggered both of those rules it makes it virtually impossible to get to your money but it's still game theory it's still a process it is not some package you buy that all of a sudden voila I'm protected guys protection is a process protection is keeping your eyes and ears open when the financial seas are calm it's perfectly appropriate for you to be the manager of your offshore LLC and take that money and do anything you want to with it including investing it back in the United States in Apple stock you can go open up an account at uh, E-Trade for all I care and trade US stocks in it or buy even US real estate but when the financial seas get murky and when they get violent and when challenges are made then your behavior is differently then your behavior is different we probably hire a professional protector we probably with your bank accounts would put your professional protector or your trust company or an offshore attorney on every account with you and we would require two signatures meaning we would require your signature and the signature of your protector or lawyer to move money that way you're never vulnerable to theft because your signature is required to move money but if a judge orders you to repatriate funds your question is yes your honor where do I sign how fast can I do it let's get that money back you're fully cooperating with the judge and what happens is three months later you find that the money didn't come back because it not only required you to cooperate with the judge it required your protector or your co-trust or, or a trustee or your offshore attorney whoever is on the account with you and the person's going to say you know it's a breach of my fiduciary duty to the contingent beneficiaries to allow this funds to be returned to the United States this this trust has all the Cuba clause all the duress clauses all the provisions properly included in any really solid asset protection plan and game theory means that you have to be standing up with your eyes open able to respond you don't just 
buy this and go to sleep. Did that make sense, Micah? I, I think it did, yeah. Um, there's some other questions. Do you want me to jump into them? or Sorry, go ahead. Sure, sure. but the, go the goal here was to make it quick and easy for a regular person to get what normally costs 25 plus grand and takes weeks to do. The trick is to make a solid plan for a regular person. That that was that's was the goal here, and that was what you know our whole focus on doing this is. But I, I want everybody to know this isn't for everybody, but this is for most people. Probably nine out of ten people are just appropriate for this. And yeah, ask the other questions. But by the way, okay. we've been on for an hour, so I don't want to make. I'll answer questions until the cows come home, but I don't want to, you know, make people uncomfortable. Yeah, and I wanted to mention the same thing. There's a lot of other questions, so thank you, Rob, for taking the time to answer them. And um, we understand if you guys have somewhere to go, we'll have a replay out of this. Um, but the one time-sensitive thing, in case you are about to jump off, is just keep in mind that we are only going to be able to take so many because you do get personal consultations with Abby. Um, and so we, you know, just understand that if you do want to watch the replay, look for that pretty quick here. Um, think, let me jump into some up of these. On, on Sunday night, if we haven't, when we sell 35 or Sunday night comes, it's closed, and it's it's done. So Perfect. Sunday Thank night you. at midnight is is it? And guys, to to buy, you have to go to that um, that screen that Micah had up earlier, where video four is. You've all seen video four. You click that button under it, and that is where you can. Um, can get moving if you want to. Yeah, and I just put that link through the chat again. Um, so it's uh, it's not to be all pitchy here. It's Rob just wants to answer questions, but in case someone needs to go, there's the link in the chat, um, and that oh, does good. reserve your spot because there there was a question um, Douglas had just asked: Is there someone in your office I can call and talk to? And that's actually the purpose of going to that link and filling that out. Um, again, read through it so you know that you're at least in the range, and that's what this call was to do is make sure everyone who signs up is. But, um, yeah, going there and signing up does get you um, the ability to talk with someone in our office. And if it doesn't work out, then, you know, there's a way also to get out of it. You have a period to review the documents and so forth. So um, I'd recommend that if you still have some questions, but it sounds, you know, basically like it's on for you. Um, let me jump into some of these other questions. Question. I mean, it's, some are pretty specific, uh, but there was a bunch of things um, real estate related that well, I'll ask in just one second. But one thing that came up from a few people, Rob, is um, you know, uh, Brian put it, what is a backup plan if Belize gets invaded militarily? And that was asked by a couple other people. But what are your thoughts there? <laughs> Belize is in a perpetual state of war with Guatemala <laughs> over, their, over their border. I've always enjoyed that. I, I I go to the border quite a bit, and uh, they still can't seem to agree on everything. If Belize gets invaded, guys, Belize is just a great country with great legislation, and you can get a bank account there when you probably will spend six months getting the same bank account in Switzerland. Belize has great laws, but there's no real magic. All countries don't recognize U.S. laws. All countries do not recognize U.S. judgments. That is every country in the world. So if Belize gets unstable or Belize gets in a revolutionary type mode, then we would very quickly, before that happened, move the trust to any other country in the world. We could move it to England. We could move it to Singapore. We could move it to almost any country in the world and we'd get it out of harm's way. You want your money to always be out of harm's way, and if you saw trouble happening there, you'd move your money out of that country. We all know, well, maybe you don't know, Belize is really a, a very, very, very peaceful country. Many of you have been there. It doesn't have the communists versus the people who want democracy. It's got all sorts of ethnic groups. It has so many people from Taiwan, you can't believe it. So many people from India, you can't believe it. So many black people that, I mean, about half the people there seem to be pretty much black complexion. There's a lot of Spanish people, a lot of Mayans. There's the Garifuncles, I can't quite say it, which are the Spanish and the Mayans. 
everybody speaks English. They fight over politics and they fight over whether homosexuality should be legalized, but they don't fight over whether you should, um, you know, have a communist government versus a democratic government. The people in Belize seem to really get along. Um, it's and I don't like Belize City at all. Uh, if you go to Belize, don't even bother with Belize City, except you may have to go there to visit your banks. But uh, it's 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 a great country, but it is not a requirement. You're not required to use Belize banks. And if this trust ever became, or this trust company ever became um, compromised because of pol pol politics in Belize, it would take you two hours to move it. Keep going, Micah. I hope that got that one. I think so. I mean, would it be safe to say this is more of a foot in the door kind of plan because you mentioned it has the flexibility to expand into different things, but it's is that yeah. fair or every plan is a foot in the door. You have to get started. The good part about Belize in Mayfair is I've taught Mayfair they they, they asked me about how we up the we I, I we wanted to up the marketing. Um, and the people who own Mayfair um, and I teamed up to do this because we thought we could bring it to regular people. But there is no magic to the, any trust company. It, it, you just need good people. The magic with Mayfair is twofold, though there is magic. First of all, Mayfair doesn't want to manage your money. It's the, one of the few trust companies, and I've trained some other ones to be this way, that will not ask you what your assets are it will not force you to disclose them. And they don't even want to know where your money is. Now that sounds foolish. They want to know that they own an offshore LLC and that they've done their job to keep you as the manager of the LLC. That's their job. They're not hired to manage $4 million of money and, and, and handle your accounts payable. They are not that type of trust company. They do not want anybody but you to handle the investments that you have. And if you want to hire an investment advisor, that's fine, but it won't be Mayfair. So that's one thing good about them. And the other thing good about them is they've, and we've instilled, and I thank God for Abby and the people there, they've supported this, a Wall Street kind of gringo attitude towards tomorrow. There is no such thing as manana at Mayfair. The word is right now not manana. You will not get any sort of Caribbean approach to life. You're going to get the Wall Street approach. And that's something that I love about Mayfair. I love it because they are really, really, really responsible and responsive, honorable and quick. And I love that. And that'll make all the difference to you guys when you start doing something. But, um, did that Very get nice. that one? Yeah, yeah I, th I think so. Thank you. I'm going to kind of jump around here because the questions are a little bit all over. Um, but one question that came up that's good from Charles, would the Belizean LLC only be used as a hole in that bucket for structural purposes or can it be used for business in other countries as well? Is it like a active? Oh, yeah, it can be, it can be, do business in other countries. It sort of depends upon the person. It is normally not good to mix of two types of assets. Say if you wanted to do a, a book publishing company uh, and you also wanted to sell nutraceuticals, I would have two entities each owned by the holding company. But that holding company in and of itself, the little orange holding company under the blue and purple trust, that little holding company can do business anywhere in the world. Just last week I had, I had Abby and I both, I've talked to Abby, Abby did this with a client. Um, a, a, an attorney wanted to open up a bank account with Wells Fargo Bank. I told her that you're probably going to have to open up a domestic LLC out of Delaware or a domestic family limited partnership probably out of Delaware because Wells Fargo is kind of a trouble. They, they, it's easier to spend the $500 than it is to get Wells Fargo to try to accept an offshore LLC. She didn't really want to do a domestic LLC or domestic partnership, so she went to her banker originally was told no, but then she went to the private bank department at Wells Fargo and a half hour later she had her account. And there's no reason that you can't even walk, take that offshore LLC, walk into Bank of America or Wells Fargo and even open up an account here. Most banks give you a lot of trouble. 
and so you might have to switch and go to two or three banks or go to higher level management. The ones that just read out of their employee handbook um, like to make you always do domestic entities because it's easier for them at the bank. But there's no reason your offshore LLC can't do anything that you would do anywhere in the world. And it is the entity through which you should conduct offshore business, either in its name directly or in the or through entities it owns, such as offshore LLCs in Belize or other countries, including the United States. Very nice, thank you. I mean, it, it sounds like, just to sum it up, you said it there, but in layman's terms, for myself maybe, um, but hopefully it's helpful that the LLC should be doing you know, whatever it needs to do for you, it's fully functional, but you don't want to use it in any sort of business activity that generates liability because the point of putting money there in the first place was to get away from liability, right? Well, you usually don't want the holding company to be generating liability. It's really important that the Purple and Blue Asset Protection Trust not engage in a trade or business or generate liability in the United States because some uh, contingent fee burglar lawyer is going to sue it. Um, I have very little respect for contingent fee litigators, as most of you know from listening to me. Um, but the United States is one of the few places that the contingent fee litigators are looking for every single excuse to tear you a new one. And they will go after whatever entities you, 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 you bring to the United States. And if you take your offshore LLC and it puts a million dollars in, in the United States in a Wells Fargo bank checking account, that million dollars is potentially reachable by one of those contingent fee burglar lawyers in California or New York or Texas. And it's not reachable if the offshore LLC goes and puts the same money into France or Singapore or Holland or Belize. Cool. Um, another question here kind of related to the LLC we were talking about a moment ago. Can the LLC be the beneficiary of the Asset Protection Trust? And um, Maria follows up and asks, what do you, Rob, recommend to protect um, real estate in the U.S.? So first off, can the LLC be the beneficiary? The LLC can be the beneficiary. And, excuse me. <coughs> I'm sorry. Sorry. The LLC can be the beneficiary. It's not normal, but it's very possible. And any, any entity or any person can be a beneficiary period. And it's important that you have contingent beneficiaries other than yourself because that is one of the reasons why the duress clause works. The duress clause says when some judge orders you to return funds, it instructs the trustee to ignore it because it's not supposed to pay attention to, to orders given under duress. Well, the only reason that works in part is because the trustee has an obligation, a fiduciary obligation, a bigger obligation than I have to my wife, my children, or my grandson. It has a bigger obligation to you than I have to my family. That's because it's your fiduciary. And those, those trustees just don't like to uh, um, transfer money away when there's contingent fee excuse me, contingent beneficiaries like your family members or your soon-to-be-born children and their children who haven't even been thought of yet. Those are all contingent beneficiaries that deserve and receive protection under this trust. And somebody, your next question was, what do I recommend about real estate? Uh, you know, I'm going give, to give you a quick example. This is a 30, maybe a minute and a half story. Most at least half of my clients have made their money in real estate. And many of them have lost their money in real estate. <laughs> but a lot of them have become fabulously rich in real estate. And my big problem with them is convincing them, showing them how their real estate is not as, as well protected, no matter what they pay me, as money and cash equivalents that can be moved out of harm's way. Real estate is nothing but dirt attached to the ground. Real estate is within a judge's penumbra. The judge can do anything he or she wants with real estate. And if your real estate is an asset that the judge feels is entitled to go to a creditor of yours, then the judge can undo all of the work I've done with a single stroke of a pen. I watched that happen in Beverly Hills about seven years ago. I represented the mother of a rotten rapist, and she'd invested a bunch of money in his business, 
and then he'd go and turned it into a really big business. She was half owner of it. But then he had gotten in trouble for raping somebody. He was not my client. I refused to represent him. Her money stayed protected. But I watched a judge look at the work of, of one of my competitors because I would not represent this man even though he asked me to. And he put his $5 million house in Beverly Hills into a big fancy uh, mortgage with a Swiss bank and he'd used a Cook Island company and he'd done all sorts of fancy protection. The judge was not impressed and it took the judge at least a minute and a half to undo the phony mortgages and undo all of the very expensive $70,000 worth of asset protection and give that property to the people who'd been injured by his horrible behavior. And um, it, it's, you, you, real estate is not as well protected as, as, as cash and cash equivalents that can be moved out of harm's way. You can change the place where money is just by wiring money from one country, Switzerland, to another country, Belize, or Belize to, to France or Singapore. That changes the ball game. You can't do that with a piece of dirt. With that said, many of my clients, though, do have lots of real estate, and they keep it in limited liability companies and they keep each piece of property in its own individual limited liability company. That way when there's a slip and fall at one apartment, it doesn't contaminate the other apartments because they're all in separate LLCs. Always divide and conquer is one of the rules. And don't look at real estate as a safe place to invest. Best you can get is 70 or 80 percent. I don't care who you go with or what they charge you and what you pay them. There's a lot of information at asset protection training on the use of LLCs. And there's a lot of videos by a man named Ryan Fowler there, who's in my mind the best in the whole United States at using domestic LLCs to protect real estate. There is things that can be done, but that's more, that's not a Mayfair plan. That's a hand holding, get a real focused LLC protection plan. And remember that all of the rules vary by state. Each state will have different rules and it will depend on many things including whether you have unrelated partners. I feel very comfortable that a properly done LLC with multiple partners who are not related that is holding real estate as part of a trade or business is going to be a relatively safe place for you to be a partial owner of something like if you own a third a third of an apartment house I don't believe your creditors or your your your, your spouse that's um, suing you for divorce is going to be quite as successful in tearing that type of property up as a property that you you just put the money into an LLC hoping to uh, keep your wife from getting it so you could give it to your scrub nurse. Um, that's LLCs and charging order protection have been abused to the point that judges are routinely going around it. So in other words, real estate is hard. And yes, it is feasible to do and we can make it so people have to work to get to it, but it's almost always better to sell real estate and protect the money. Hey, uh, Rob, thank you for yeah. that. And that's, that's a lot of the domestic real estate stuff. I'm going to leave you with one other question um, and Abby's going to organize some of the other questions for me. But um, the last question, just on the real estate note, before I jump and then she'll prepare some for you, uh, was the question about foreign real estate. How does that interact? Is it just in the oh, foreign LLC? Beautiful, and beautiful for foreign real estate. The offshore LLC, um, if it wanted to own a piece of real estate in Spain, it would probably form a Spanish pass-through entity and own it. If it wanted to be a partner in a development in uh, Paraguay, and say it was a 50% partner, it would probably form a Paraguayan company and it would end up own half and the other half would be owned by whatever unrelated partners were doing the deal with you. It's a beautiful vehicle to do offshore real estate. Domestic United States real estate is not as well protected as offshore real estate. We're one of the only countries that allows contingent fee litigators to just tear people up. Any, any lawyer who's graduated from law school who's sitting there unemployed or unemployable right now has the power if he's got $500 in his pocket to file a $10 million lawsuit against anybody on this phone for virtually any reason. 
and the cost of just getting out of that lawsuit is normally hundreds of thousands of dollars. And it's nice to have asset protection in place because sometimes you can even choose to ignore those lawsuits. I don't ever ignore lawsuits anymore. But sometimes, and I do have clients that have gone to the stage where their asset protection is so old and cold and their assets are so offshore that they don't even recognize, they don't even worry about lawsuits anymore because their money is, the money that they live on is in safe places where they essentially cannot be effectively sued. That get it? Micah? Abby? Yes, Rob, I'm here. Okay. If there's any more questions, I'll answer them. Otherwise, I, you know, we've gone for an hour and 20 minutes. I'm, I'm happy to keep going now. Okay. Um, let's see. There, there was some questions about what is the yearly cost, which we already um, went over the initial um, cost. Yes, there is um, a follow-up yearly fee. Rob, do you want me to go ahead and, and answer that? Yeah. No, please do that. And also, will you please point out why the fee is lower if they move quickly? Guys, it is really hard when you start doing one of these and then you take months to think about it. We don't want clients like that. Um, it's We want people that focus and do the job. So tell them the annual fees, Ab. Okay. So we um, I did cover the initial cost earlier, but maybe there were some that weren't on. I'll just um, briefly um, say those again. With this promotion, we are offering um, the Belizean Asset Protection Trust and the Belizean Limited Liability Company um, for $31.97 or two payments of $1,625. Um, therefore, each year after the yearly maintenance fee for both of those, um, the trust and the LLC is $24.50. With our special promotion, if, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and to clear my throat, <clears throat> if the client, after receiving their initial documents, if we're able to um, get those um, approved by the client or maybe amend them as the client asks, but as long as they can get through them and get them back to us within a week, then we'll reduce their yearly renewal fees to twenty three fifty dollars um, forever. <laughs> so it gives them a little bit of extra savings. Um, let's see, there was one little bit more information here. Oh, just a second, I'm trying to scroll down here to the... Okay, um, hold on Rob, I got some more questions it looks like right here. Okay, uh, one question that came up here at the bottom, Rob, if you want to touch on that. I've seen some questions about stocks. This one says, I asked a question about U.S. publicly traded company stock. I think the answer probably is similar to the answer about U.S. real estate, but possibly a quick comment would be appreciated. Oh, and good. That's a good Brian. question. Brian, good question. Um, look, here's what I consider nirvana. Nirvana is having the structure that uh, we're proposing to build for you and having a Swiss bank that lets you invest in U.S. stock through the Swiss bank street name. This is Nirvana. It's really not something you're going to be able to set up out of the box. It's something that might take you six months of work once you had the plan in place. Unless you had the horsepower to you know, to make really large deposits at the few banks that routinely offer this service. But the best situation is to have a trust owning an offshore LLC and have that LLC open an account with one of the institutions that invest back in U.S. stock through the street name. And say you had $10 million of U.S. stock at Picked A Bank, you would you move that money from Oppenheimer in New York City to pick a bank in Switzerland. Somehow in the back rooms are able to move the stock without it being a taxable event. I've never been able to figure that out. I've been a tax professor at USC Law School and Business School in many places for years of my life. I've, I was a full-time professor for seven years of my life. 
I still can't figure out how they do that without that being a taxable event, but it happens every day, so I don't don't question that, that it works. I'd love you to have your money at Pick Day Bank invested in Apple stock, and nobody would ever know that it was your money because all they know is it's Pick Day street name. The only entities, the only entity that knows that that's your assets, is Pick Day. And when you do your tax return, the income from that stock will show up on your personal income tax return as a set law of the trust. That's that's the best way to own and invest back in real estate. Probably the best, second best, is to have one of the investment brokers that can arrange street name type investments back in the United States. Um, that used to be pretty comfortable until January of this year when many of those companies stopped wanting U.S. citizens. And the reason is that the cost, I've talked to many of them, the reason is that the cost of applying, of, of complying with FACTA is a, that's the, that's the recent legislation that forces them, if they take U.S. citizens to be transparent um, and, 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 and make that information available upon request, um, the, to, in order to use fact, in order to be FACTA compliant, it's costing these companies nearly a quarter million dollars. So many of them just choosing not to have U.S. citizens. It's just too expensive and too big of a pain in the butt. And the United States internal um, need and a requirement that they know everything about everything has just made uh, some of these smaller institutions not will or, or not want U.S. citizens in order to save a quarter million dollars in compliance cost every year. I hope that helped, Abby. Okay, thank you, Rob. Um, okay, it's about a half hour over the time, Rob. I, do you think you covered everything I, that you I, wanted? I to think do? we're done, guys. And I, I really, okay. really, really believe in this, and I hope that you all do it. I know you all won't, but it's my dream, my hope that you all have um, a real good protected life, and don't take it lightly. This is a we're trying to make this available in a way that is really a good deal for you and, and, and please let me know what you think. I'm I'm really interested in in how how this works for you. Uh, I, guys do it. If it's if if your life if you're if you live in the dangerous world that I do, please don't forget to take a little bit of your time to protect what you've worked so hard for. And that's pretty much all I have to say. All right. Well, we want to thank you for joining us. And yes. um, I see that there's been several uh, people securing plans as this webinar has been going. And um, we're getting some limited uh, spaces left. So I hope that you enjoyed the webinar today. Yay. That's, that's me clapping. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all. You know, the whole bunch of you, over 44, stayed for an hour and a half. And I really think that's a giant compliment. And I know that I appreciate it. I know that Abby appreciates it. I know that she's and the people at Mayfair have put just massive amounts of time and energy into making this experimental process something that really works for you. Please feed back to us. Let us know. We want to help you. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everybody. We're going to go ahead and, and sign off the webinar. Thank you all. Bless you all. Okay.